morning. Good morning, mayors. Um, so in the first panel, when we were talking to uh, journalists, um, I think they, they asked a very interesting question, is when people come from outside the region to the Midwest, to the heartland, what do they most get wrong? What do you think, what do, what do you think is the story that's happening here that people are most missing around the country? Mayor Fry? Most often they're thinking of Minneapolis and Minnesota as flyover territory where it's cows and pastures, but you know, here and in snow. Minneapolis... Only about the snow. And yeah, yeah perhaps yeah. a lot of snow too, and they think of it being exceedingly cold, you know, but right now outside it's, it's, it's nearly 70 degrees. We we're living in a booming city that has grown by 50,000 people or so in wow. just the last 10 years. Uh, we've got beard award-winning restaurants. Uh, we have you know, sidewalks that are teeming with people and activity. We've got more Fortune 500 companies uh, per capita than pretty much any city in the entire country. And so, you know, there's a whole lot going on here in the Midwest. And by the way, we label it the North. That's, okay. that's the, that's, that would be the correct label. Okay. So I would say the same thing. People are surprised that it's a booming community. There's a lot of growth going on. Um, of course, in our community, Mayo Clinic's our largest employer, so people know they're going to get good health care, but they're always surprised at how welcoming and warm the community is and, and how much activity is going on. So, uh, you know, You're same. Well, I would say this, the same. The weather piece is always yeah. the most. It's unbearably cold and terrible, and, and it is, so they're right. Um, <laughs> but the aspect, I think, is even more of an issue is um, in greater Minnesota versus um, there's, a, there's a, I think the, the misconception is oftentimes the urban area, Minneapolis, St. Paul, Twin Cities area versus greater Minnesota. Yeah. So some, some aspects that there are a lot of times, and I'm a former legislator, so even my colleagues back then, didn't realize that we still have the same issues there are urban the changing demographics all of the same yeah. issues that any city in minnesota has but any city in the country has right. so almost whatever is the issue of the day nationally is the same issues in, a, in our small yeah. town and even in greater minnesota we're going to come back to that urban rural uh, divide in, in a minute but, but i want you in general you're talking about the thriving i mean you know a lot of people their first image is blue collar what we we're talking about before in, in the film and, and earlier that blue collar industrial decline, you know, kind of rusting factories as kind of the, you know, the state flag. But here, I mean, we're talking about very much information age economies at this point. What drives your growth in Minneapolis and Rochester? What is driving your growth? You right now, we're seeing in Minneapolis what major cities throughout the country are seeing. Uh, you have people that are wanting to live in an urban area. It's a perhaps a culture shift. Mm -hmm. uh, they want to live around diversity. They want to be able to walk down the streets and have a thousand different tastes and smells and sounds and people all on the same block even. And yes, the economy is changing as well, and part of that is, is increasing the growth that, growth that we're already seeing. You know, this is, this is no longer the, you know, American dream of the 1950s where the whole goal was kind of the, the white picket fence and the 45-minute commute into work. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, as you mentioned, a lot of the factories are closing. But, you know, we in Minnesota right now have almost like more jobs than we know what to do with. We have like 140,000 job vacancies right now in Minnesota, and we're working at retaining and recruiting talent to make sure that we can fill those jobs. So if you want a job, if you want a great place to live, Minnesota's a spot. 140,000 jobs that are unfilled in the... We, we've got the most recent figure. I think it's even above yeah. that now. It might wow. be 150 or 160,000, and, and the numbers are projected to go up dramatically from there. And, and by the way, like, a lot of these jobs are, are like high-paying, good jobs that we just need people to fill. Yeah, people talk about meds and eds as, a, as kind of the formula for cities to, uh, in many cases, like a place like Pittsburgh that went through industrial decline, came back through meds and eds. I mean, there can't be many places that are more meds and eds, uh, as well as engineering and tech, than, than, than talk about that. that what Absolutely. drives your economy? Yeah, Rochester has the best of both worlds, in my opinion. We're a great community. We have um, certainly Mayo Clinic and the strong um, health care base, basis, but we also had uh, IBM as the largest employer for a long time. It's now the second largest employer, mm. but still a huge influence in our community. Um, we do have a little bit of ag yet, um, so we still have that urban... Uh, and then the rural feel with, with ag and, and being a small community away from the Twin Cities. 2.2% uh, unemployment. Wow. So we, yeah. too, are desperate for employees, and we'll, we try to steal them from Jacob and, uh. you know. 
a, a smaller place. Can you, as 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 you kind of listen to that, that kind of the economy moving toward these kind of you know information age, post-industrial jobs, people wanting to live in cities. Can you compete with that, or do you feel as though that economic boom is passing you by? Well, see, and even that's a misconception. Okay. A smaller place because St. Cloud, the well, eighth largest city, but as a region, the daytime population of city more than doubles. So the regional mm -hmm. aspect, one of the mm -hmm. areas that we have, and actually. Our largest employer is healthcare. So, it also, uh, so is also healthcare. We have, and, and it's the it's the fastest growing sector, um, and that it's an aging population. But we also we're a college town, so there's aspects of that too. But as a regional center, we have retail, and when you see nationally a lot of retail. In fact, we've seen it also where we've had places that have closed uh, and went bankrupt. Uh, Herberger's, uh, Sears, uh, Shopco, all of those entities that, that we have that, like other communities have, but we we have a we have a, a mall that is completely 100% uh, full. So um, we have a lot of retail that's been added. Um, you know those types of jobs as a regional what's center. What's Herberger's? I'm just kidding. <laughs> so uh, let me ask you, because I mean, part, you know, part of the debate, and, and certainly uh, 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 brought higher to the, the, the surface by the results of the 2016 election, where we saw this very stark divide between the biggest urban areas and how they voted, and smaller, mid-sized to smaller. Mid-sized? Uh, um, mid, uh, uh, mid-sized to smaller. You know, was, was the sense in many communities that too much, and, and we're going to talk about the flip side of this in a minute, that too much of the growth is now concentrating into the very largest places, and that there are lots of communities in America that feel they are being left behind, particularly as the economy evolves away from the you know, old uh, manufacturing and energy production. You don't feel that. You, do you feel as though the, the, the success of Minneapolis and the Minneapolis region comes at your expense, or that there is essentially a, a, a rising tide that is lifting all communities? Well, I would agree with Mayor Fry, because the aspect of people we are at the same position that every other city is. Unemployment is extremely low. Yeah. Uh, and economic development, uh, I've been mayor for 13 and a half years. Economic development used to always bring, bring in all these companies so you can bring in all the jobs. Right. Now our, our focus is bring in all these employees so we can actually fill the jobs that are there. Um, so it becomes more the issue of livability. And I think mm -hmm. there's, if you look at all the national trends, of course, um, millennials and Gen Zs uh, are more urban in fact, for the first time on the planet, we have more people living in cities than we have yeah. at any time in our mm -hmm, history of mm -hmm. this planet. Mm -hmm. So there is a, there's a movement to where people want to live. And so cities, and, and we, we're focusing on the livability aspect of things. So, um, and, and no, what, I don't believe that's the case. In fact, um, you, you can still uh, commute in St. Cloud is never going to be more than 20 minutes uh -huh. <laughs> anywhere well, in the know, entire city. So there's other aspects. That's a quality of life issue. Well, you call livability, you know, I, I've heard in other cities called the problems of success. I mean, I grew up in the 70s in New York. The era of Fort in New York dropped dead. And the last thing that people were worried about were too many people trying to come live uh, in cities. But now, in fact, you're adding population, which means higher prices, uh, higher housing costs, uh, which means displacement. Uh, in many places. You have moved very, more aggressively than almost any city to try to deal with that in terms of how you uh, structure your zoning laws and allowing for a kind of multifamily development. Can you talk about what are there problems of success that you are dealing with in Minneapolis and how have you tried to respond to those? Of course there are issues that are associated with the success and when you have tons of people that want to live in Minneapolis, they want to live in and around the downtown core, but you don't have a housing supply to accommodate it, the prices continuously get yeah. jacked up. And so to tackle an affordable housing equation, you really got to look at it from two facets. One, y you need subsidy. You need to bridge the gap between whatever constitutes the market rate and the affordable rate. And by the way, we've invested about three times the previous record, $40 million in affordable housing, yeah. specifically focused on that low income and deeply affordable housing. But the second piece is you need to allow for the additional supply. Uh, and I'm a believer that we should have a diversity of housing options in every neighborhood. In every neighborhood. In right. every neighborhood. We should have a diversity of housing options, and it follows a diversity of people and socioeconomic backgrounds and races in every neighborhood. Because when you got a thousand different ideas at the table, that's when great ideas take shape. That's when entrepreneurship gets triggered. And that's ultimately when our city is really going to rock. But in order to, allow, uh, to get it, you first need to allow for it. And we had a city and have a city that, you know, is exclusively zoned, uh, uh, two-thirds of it as much, for single-family homes. 
And we're not outlawing single-family homes. We're not getting rid of single-family homes. But we're saying, in addition to being able to put up a mansion, you can also put up something more affordable in the form of like a duplex or a triplex. You can build taller on commercial corridors. And, you know, you talked about livability a second ago. What is livable for one person is not livable for another. You know, your definition of livability, you know, who knows, may be uh, living on a farm. Uh, my definition of li livability, you know, my wife and I, we live in a loft on a, on a bustling commercial corridor. We barely ever cook. We go to the bar like every other night, I feel like, and get a great meal. Mm. That's, that's livable for us. And, you know, when my security does, doesn't get too pissed off, I bike to work, uh -huh. you know? And so that's, that's how people want to live. And so it's dramatically shifting, and we need to account for that shift. Um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a place like Rochester, uh, do you face some of those same housing affordability issues? And, and could you envision a world where you're allowing uh, not only, you know, eliminating single family zoning uh, in big areas? Uh, or is that something that's really just an urban, the most urban communities? No, I think what you're, you're hearing here, here from three different communities, three different size communities yeah. with, you know, different economies is that we have the same problems. Um, we've worked very hard uh, to uh, grow a vibrant community so that young people want to stay in Rochester. I think historically people uh, grew up in Rochester and then left for the big city. Now people are coming, younger people are coming to our community because they're seeing um, a community that's starting to hop a little bit and, and that we have uh, the amenities that they want. Um, I don't, you know, the Twin Cities is, is doing their zoning I, and, and I think I heard you're not going to get rid of single family completely, or are you? We are getting rid of single-family zoning completely. 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 We yeah. are not going to get rid yeah. of it completely, uh -huh. but we have also changed our zoning ordinances over the last year, and we will continue to, to build density in the inner city and stop the sprawl that we have and allow more. Um, we have R2X zoning. We've just put it in place, kind of a step Which, up for neighborhoods so that you have um, larger apartments and duplexes. Mm. We're working on uh, growing our condo uh, communities uh, you know, maybe Jacob's been there before and he's made yeah. a change to move away from it. Uh, we're at that point right now, but we're not going to get rid of single family do, homes. Do you face housing affordability issues or do you, in fact, are benefiting from people looking for more affordable options in uh, smaller we're places? We're facing the same, same issues that every other city is yeah. facing. In fact, uh, we, we're facing the shortage. Uh, we know that the state has a shortage. That study's been done. We know that in the next five years, we need 10,000, I think, in a year of additional housing, and that's at all levels. So you're looking at all aspects of whether it's single family, whether mm. it's multiple or senior housing, um, affordable housing, all of those levels. We just did our study too, so we know uh, we, we're, we have a capacity issue, and that's, that's the aspect of, part of that aspect of livability. Capacity so, issue meaning what? Uh, well, we, we, don't have enough, we don't have enough housing. We yeah. do not have enough units at pretty much every level. So it's a matter of um, you know, having uh, housing uh, in your community at all those levels, so it's a, it's a, it's an aspect, and it, particularly workforce housing. You know, you have all of these uh, jobs available, but uh, where's the housing aspect yeah. of it? And that's the important piece of it. So no, we we still have those uh, those types of issues, but uh, our our focus is you know, so how do we how do we engage and how do we in our zoning we wouldn't. We, we, we're, we move a lot to uh, planned unit development, so PUDs, so we can actually look at communities and neighborhoods and, and plan that type of mixed use through that process, uh, yeah. what, you know, what a particular neighborhood, what a particular demographic wants to see. So we, we engage people in that aspect as to, you know, to be living in dynamic zoning. I mean, that's what zoning yeah. is all about. It's, it's, it's to have something that's not you know, static, but to have it dynamic and change and change, continue to change with the demographics and change with the community. Yeah, I was just going to say one other difference is we're, we're regional centers in rural, in a rural area. So we do also have the, um, maybe luxury, if you will, of having a lot of commuters from uh, a rural area yeah. right outside yeah. where the traffic's not bad to get in and out. Mm -hmm. And it makes a little bit of difference in the needs that we have compared to a dense urban So we spent area. our first 10 minutes or so talking mostly about uh, the, the macro trend of greater urbanization and what it means for all of your cities. Let's talk about another big trend that is changing Minnesota, which is growing diversity. I mean, you know, um, in 1990, 95% of the Minneapolis metro area was white. Now it's about, I think, three quarters. Um, you have, you're dealing with much more diverse populations than many people here grew up with, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Talk a little bit about what this means for each of your cities. Mayor Frank? It's incredible. Uh, I 
firmly believe that what makes Minneapolis exceptional uh, is having this broad spectrum of ideas and mentalities and, and backgrounds. You know, we've got the largest Somali population in the entire world, I believe outside of mm -hmm. Somalia, or mm -hmm. at the very least in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, and it's something that we're exceedingly proud of, and not just our Somali population, by the way, but our, our Latino population and our, our Hmong population, our, our black American population. Um, now, what we still encounter is massive se segregation. So while we are a diverse city, many of these communities are largely segregated, and it was done intentionally. Mm -hmm. And right now, we need to make sure that the precision of our solutions match the precision of the harm that was initially inflicted. And that harm was precise. Uh, and so as we look to allow for a, a beautiful diversity of, of neighborhoods, um, you know, we also need to make sure that we're accounting for a plethora of other issues that have, have plagued these communities, and intentionally so, for years. You know, before I move on to the other cities, I want to I follow up, because um, when John Hickenlooper was the mayor of Denver before he was the governor and briefly a presidential candidate, he, he talked about what he called the Denver Paradox. And the Denver Paradox was, and I think it applies to many cities and certainly would apply to Minneapolis, we have a quality of life and a strength of an economy that is attracting people from all over the world to come live here. And yet, we cannot put our own kids from low-income and minority neighborhoods on a track to compete for the jobs that we are creating that are bringing people in from everywhere else. Do you feel that applies to Minneapolis? Uh, I don't, I don't you, you, you said the word can. Um, and, and absolutely we can, but it's going to take really intentional things to undo some of the decisions that were made over the period of 100 years. We've got, we have maps at the city, you know, prescriptive mm. maps that, that quite literally designate North Minneapolis as a slum for blacks and Jews. You talked about this in your State of the City yep. this year. So what are, in your view, the targeted solutions that are of magnitude to the challenge? Uh, so I think, it, one, it was what we did with the comprehensive plan, which was to allow for a diversity of housing options in, in all neighborhoods. Uh, two, it's work to make sure that from the very beginning, people have stable housing. And we've got a program called Stable Homes, Stable Schools, uh, that we're, we're putting money into to make sure that children uh, don't need to move from school district to, from school to school in, in one year. They have stable housing, hopefully within a radius of where their school is located, and we've made sure to, to specifically target the 15 schools that have the highest rate of both free and reduced lunch as well as homelessness. Uh, we're incorporating economic inclusion into everything we do to make sure that the communities that, the, the communities that have made these corridors wonderful to begin with can experience some of the gains in wealth when big development comes in. Yeah. You know, and to, to tackle that dynamic, look, it's difficult. It is really hard. Um, but it's something that is definitely worth leaning into. Uh, real quick, before I come to the other mayors, you know, you talked about the schools. And to me, when, as we go from city to city, one of the most revealing stats is when you look at the share of kids of color who are in schools where a majority of their classmates qualify as poor or low income versus the share of white kids. And that is really one of the most telling measures of segregation. Many, Minneapolis actually does better than many places, but still, you're talking about half, roughly half the kids of color in your, in your public schools are in schools where a majority of their classmates qualify as poor or low income. It's one in 10 for white students. Can you get the kind of convergence of opportunity that you're seeking while you're dealing with that larger disparity in terms of economic segregation? Absolutely, you can. Uh, but it's funny, you know, sometimes the only thing that people hate worse than the status quo is any change at all. Huh. And in this case, yes, we do need change. Yeah. We need to push for it, you know, full throttle. And in order to see success, you have to have different mechanisms of success around you. You know, I, I want children to grow up in communities where they've got a cornucopia mm. of different options as to what to do with their life. You know, if, if you want to be a mechanic, you can be a mechanic. If you want to be a doctor or a lawyer or the mayor of Minneapolis, like you can do every one of those things. And by the way, you know people in your neighborhood that are striving towards those, yeah. those goals. And, and the only way you get that is, is if you have, again, a diversity of socioeconomic backgrounds in each neighborhood. Right now, we don't have it. Yeah. And, be, and largely because of it, yes, we struggle. Uh, by the way, folks, if you want to uh, submit your questions, we'll be taking them in a few minutes. May Mayor, what, what, is, what is growing diversity meant for you, for Rochester? Well, I think uh, Rochester has embraced diversity for some time. I think it's been helpful. Uh, we had 
uh, unlike maybe uh, Mayor Fry here, ours came slowly and in waves over the years. Um, partly, we look back at the history of IBM, and IBM in the 1950s was actively recruiting um, black Americans uh, around. They were in job fairs all over this country, mm. and our community was the beneficiary of a lot of that effort. Mm. And so for a long time, and Mayo Clinic, of course, uh, also hires a very diverse workforce. So we have um, had a slow but steady growth and change, and so we don't have the pockets or the segregation in neighborhoods mm. like, the, like the Twin Cities do. Our, we have fairly well dispersed huh. populations of color and poverty and income throughout the whole city, which I think is a plus for us. Um, not that we still don't have challenges, because we do. Our academic disparities are large, and we can't, you know, no matter what we're doing, we seem to be unable to uh, to address that. So, um, and I think that's yeah, something I mean, we reached, all share. You reached an agreement with the state about school discipline a couple of years ago, right? I mean, kind of di disparate levels of. I mean, so, so the school that that issue of kind of creating opportunity more equal opportunity in the schools. Yeah, and I think one of, still one of our big changes is that our school districts, while our community is probably, I don't have the exact amount, but 20 some percent diverse in the community wide, our school systems are around 46 percent diverse, and that's been growing and changing um, considerably and constantly, and I, you know, that'll affect some of the outcomes so moving ahead. So, Mayor, Cla Mayor Cla obviously, uh, you know, you, you, your, your community was the subject of an article in the New York Times this summer uh, about uh, anxiety about growing immigrant population backlash. Where do you think those issues stand in St. Cloud Well, I, 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 we were subject to that. I would disagree. We could spend all the time just yeah. talking about the article, but there, that's that external perspective again that gets it wrong, I think, oftentimes. What do you think is the real the story community. then? Well, 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 first of all, we, we've changed uh, as you, demographically. And right. If you go back even 20 years ago, sure. we were at a non-white population of 2%, yep, right. uh, and that's at about 17.8% right. now. So right. there's, a, there's been a significant change, and a lot of that, a lot of that has been through immigration, refugees. Uh, we have a large East African population that we have had for the last 15 years. So there is a lot of change in demographics uh, in our area, but uh, I, I would agree with what's been said. It's, 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 it's what makes communities livable. It's what people want to see, that that diversity is added so much. It's added so much to our country. It's added so much to our state. It's added to our community. So we embrace that aspect of, of having... Well, obviously, some people who are not embracing it. Do you feel that they are... Well, there, they're, 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 there they're are some minor... people that are not embracing it in every city yes, in America, in, right. every, in every place, every country mm -hmm. in the but world. But you think the majority and, is embracing uh, it? Absolutely, it's embracing it. I, 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 you know, that you, you can look at the growth. You look at a community that's been around for 163 years. We've never had a year where we didn't have growth, and that's population growth. We've never had a situation. I'll give you, give you a great ex, uh, example. It's collaboration and partnership. We focus on a lot of the non-government partnerships. So the solution this has to, has to be from engaging your community, but engaging your community, what will change and what will change that perception and will change stories like that we're in the New, in the New York Times, I always say, is actions, not words. And the actions is to actually engage and, and that you have to continue to have a community that reflects the community as, and that includes from employment, that includes from, mm -hmm. from all aspects, from government on down. So. Our aspect is how do we engage, how do we partner with folks, and how do we empower people to be making those decisions? There's a great examples of that. We just passed a, we, we just, uh, in fact, Monday I'll be at the grand opening of our, our school. We have a new high school. Mm. A new high school built in a community when most of the people who voted for that on a referendum over a $110 million facility do not have any kids in the school Well, that, that's interesting. That's a telling story for a community to be able to do that. That is, because, I mean, one of the things that, you know, it is true in the country overall, but really comes in relief in Minnesota, is that the demographic change really overlaps with kind of generational change. I, I looked at the numbers. 88% of everybody in the state between the age of 50 and 60 is white. A third of everybody in the state between 5 and 15 is non-white. I mean, the change is coming, it's concentrated in the schools. There's kind of a, a, a you know, a, a cult, what people have called a cultural generation gap in terms of the diversity. And to what extent, I, I, I'm sure that your Minneapolis public schools are substantially kids of color in a community where a lot of the older folk, older people are white. And so do you find that to be a challenge to convince kind of an older, whiter population that they have a stake in investing in a younger non-white population? No, I, I believe uh, in the city of Minneapolis. I believe that regardless of you know what's happening at the at the federal level, uh, Minneapolis residents kind of want to be that beacon of hope and uh -huh. inclusivity and opportunity and hopefully hopefully an example for for others to follow. 
Uh, but yes, there, there has been a tremendous change in the, in the demographics over the last several years. I mean, there's been a demographic in terms of race and, and, and age. You know, I'm not that old, you know, uh, but about uh, more than 50% of the population is actually younger than me, which was an excellent election talking point while I was on the campaign. Mm. Uh, huh. But uh, not to mention, I'm not from here. You know, I would, I would bet that if you were to go back and look at some of those demographics, you know, from 40, 50 years ago, almost everybody, they were like born in, a lot of them were born in Minnesota, or else they were like born as an immigrant coming from Germany or Norway. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I grew up on the East Coast and I, I didn't move here by default. I moved here because I fell in love with the city. Can I ask one last, I want to get to one last area of kind of, uh, and again, something we see more in, in a lot of states where there has become rather pitch conflict over state policy between rural areas and metro areas. Uh, there have been differences about guns, for example, here in, in, in Minnesota uh, that have kind of fallen into that, into that chasm. To what extent do you feel there is kind of an urban-rural Divide, or, and to what extent do you think that uh, that the that the success of urban the urban parts of the state, which are you know two percent unemployment, uh, does create benefit for those non-metro areas? Mayor Norton, maybe start. Oh, for heaven's sake! Because <laughs> you, you came out of the legislature. <laughs> I, well, I came out of the legislature for a reason. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, and and I I was so. saying earlier I was the chair of the rural caucus from Rochester uh, while I was there. There is a growing uh, divide. It's it's uh, tearing our country apart. Um, I think I, there aren't going to be the same kinds of jobs in uh, rural America as there have been in the past, and it's a struggle for communities. Mm -hmm. So as, as an urban center, again, we can, with the 2% unemployment, we're happy to have people from our neighboring communities uh, come in. And my hope is that some of those young people that grow up will stay in some of those outlying areas too. We're happy to welcome them in Rochester, but those communities need a, a support base to continue on and, and, and not dry up. So, I'm interested in your thought. It's well, it's, uh, I, I happen to be probably, right I don't know, the only city that still has farms. I have farms actually in, in my city. In the so, city, uh, yeah, there well. is, So we have an agricultural zone. There's not many. Yeah. There's five or six farms, but they're in yeah. the city. Um, so that, and we are, as a regional center, you, you, you really get that, that rural area because we're that is where most of the folks that are coming into my city on a regular basis are from rural Minnesota and to shop, to, yeah, to go to sure. school, to work, right, to, right. to play. Um, so that aspect of things is, you know, we embrace that, that piece of it. And, that, and that's the aspect when I, when I talk about the aspect of livability, it's trying to engage people in, in all aspects so that there's that, there's that piece for everyone uh, in a community, but it, it creates partnerships and that's the aspect that's an important aspect of it. As a community, I, we just there's an announcement, and this is one of the I, one quick little yeah. uh, partnership, and that's with the Boys and Girls Club um, and the St. Cloud Technical and Community College, and and, an, and a, a, a generous entrepreneur that's willing to give some dollars where they're they're taking and they're embracing the, the it's called Career Starts, where the Boys and Girls Club from from kindergarten on up are embracing the concept of of employment and in, in, in the community. They have a benefactor that's going to pay for their their college tuition uh, if they go through this program and you've got a technical community college that's willing to to do that at no limit. So that's taking a, a holistic approach, private approach, uh, to to working with a student all the way through all the, the way beginning. Through. And that's through, that's employers, entrepreneurs, and that, that's success. Can I ask you real quick, Mayor, because uh, as a final thought, when you look at state policy, to what extent is Minnesota getting what it needs out of the state to thrive? Economic policy, social policy, and to what extent do you see a conflict between your vision of what the city needs to, to thrive and what legislators from more rural areas are willing to implement as state policy? The urban-rural divide is real, and it is perpetuated by people who stand to benefit from it. Uh, but when you look at each one of the, you know, what respective individuals need from either the city of Minneapolis or Rochester or, or, or Crosby or St. Cloud, it's largely the same stuff, you know? You know, they need a job, they need safety, they need affordable housing, they need housing. to get from point A to point B via transportation, schools like the they need good schools. This is the same stuff, mm -hmm. right. you know? And we need to be rallying around that common vision. And by the way, I'm a firm believer in cities. I believe that cities are the laboratory of democracy. Uh, and I believe that the more ability that cities and mayors 
and cities' councils have to shape policy to be innovative, to try new things. Some of them will work out. Some of them won't, by the way. Uh, that's kind of a recipe for success from which others can adopt and move in the right direction. Great. Will you join me in thanking our mayors? Thank you.